Unit 8, Recording 2. So, generally things are going fine. We've talked about your attitude to work, which is very good. Over the three years that you've worked here, you've shown a consistently professional approach to your work. Thank you. I must say that I've enjoyed it very much. Testing computer games is great fun, and my colleagues are very helpful and supportive. So, the next part of this appraisal is to think about the future. What do you see yourself doing next? Well, as I say, I've really enjoyed the games testing work that I've been doing, but I feel that it's time I moved on now. I mean, I think I'd like to have a bit more responsibility. Yes, I think we need to think about that. You've shown some good leadership skills, and I wonder how you would feel about becoming a team leader. You know, then you'd be supervising a team of games testers and making sure everything gets done properly. Oh, yes. I'd like to very much. Though I'm not sure that I've got all the necessary skills, to be honest. I mean, I'd like the responsibility, but... Uh... Would there be any management training? Yes, of course. We run some excellent in-house courses, which I think would give you confidence. There's one coming up next week, and then another in two months' time. And I think I'd rather you did the first one, so that we don't waste any more time. What do you think? Well, yes, I'd be very interested. It would be great to get some training underway as soon as possible. I mean, I'd rather not wait for two months, if that's OK with you. I'd like to be as prepared as I can. OK, great. In that case, I'd better get your name on the list for the one next week immediately. I hope it's not full up already. I don't think it will be. Perhaps I'll just check with Jeannie now. Excuse me, just one minute. Oh, hello, Jeannie. I just wanted to check if you've still got places on the management skills course for next week. Uh-huh. Ah, you have. Great. Could I put Will Scott's name down, please? Yes. S C O double T. Unit 8. Recording 3. 1. I feel that it's time I moved on now. 2. I think I'd rather you did the first course. 3. I'd rather not wait for two months. Four. I'd better get your name on the list immediately. Unit 8. Recording 4. Hi, Will. How did your appraisal go? Oh, it went well, thanks. My boss thinks it's time I had more responsibility and maybe became a team leader. Oh, that's good. How do you feel about that? I'm pleased because I was thinking of looking for a better job in another company but I'd rather stay here if I can. It would be great if you were our team leader. <laughs> I'd rather you were in charge than someone we don't know. Oh, thanks. Anyway, I'd better go because I've got a meeting in five minutes. See you later. Unit 8. Recording 5. 1. She isn't very strict and she hardly ever gets upset or worried. 2. He's the kind of person who has one aim and works hard to achieve it, doesn't he? 3. She's determined to do what she wants and won't listen to advice from anyone. 4. He uses words in a funny, intelligent and interesting way. 5. She really enjoys meeting and talking to people, doesn't she? 6. He's one of those people who is always honest and doesn't keep secrets from anyone. 7. He has very strong views about a lot of things in a way that annoys a lot of people. 8. She's the kind of person who cares only about herself rather than other people. 9. He's good at making things happen and change. He doesn't just react to events, does he? 10. She's one of those people who is good at secretly controlling or tricking people to get what she wants. Unit 8, recording 6. <laughs> Thank you.
Today on Sports Alive, we are looking at success and achievement in sport. Who are the most successful sports people in the world and just how do they achieve their success? There is a huge sports psychology industry working with almost all athletes these days. But does it work? Is it all really necessary? We've got sports psychologist Tony Greenwood here to help us answer these questions. Hello, Tony. Welcome to the programme. Hello. So, first of all, Tony, let's think about that question. Is sports psychology really necessary? Some people would say that you've either got the determination to succeed or you haven't. What do you think? Well, I suppose that's sometimes true. There are examples of sports people who are extremely successful and have never needed any help with their mental determination. Muhammad Ali was probably the most famous of all. He had complete self-belief that he was the best and absolutely unbeatable. Mm, that's right. Nobody needed to remind him to focus on the goal. <laughs> no. And there are other examples of sports people who seem to be totally committed to their own success. Tennis player Bjorn Borg, racing driver Michael Schumacher and basketball player Michael Jordan, to name a few. But these people are actually quite rare. Most sports people do a lot of work on mental preparation and get a lot of help with staying focused on winning. OK, so what do the sports psychologists do? How do you help people to succeed? Well, our basic job is to prepare the mind, and we can do this in different ways depending on who we're working with. One of the most important things we do is to help people change negative thoughts into positive ones. I did some work with a footballer recently. He missed a really important goal and started thinking that he couldn't do it anymore. I told him he could do it by thinking about something different, not on missing the goal. After practising thinking about the way the ball was turning instead, his whole game improved dramatically. Mm. Kelly Holmes is a good example of that too, isn't she? Yes, that's right. For much of her career, she was constantly getting injured and then worrying that it would happen again. I remember that she admitted feeling totally out of control when she got injured all the time. But the fact is, athletes have to get over that and start to take control mentally. That's exactly what she did. And then, of course, won two gold medals at the Athens Olympics, which was a fantastic achievement. Yes, she was really brilliant. There are other things we can do to help with mental preparation too. Things like routines to get the players focused and working as a team can really help. Routines? What do you mean? Well, the New Zealand All Blacks rugby team do their haka war dance to focus themselves and to try and worry the other team. Then there are people who have their own personal lucky routines. Footballer Andrew Coles said he always wanted to be the last player onto the pitch. It might seem a bit silly, but if it works, then why not give it a go? Unit 8, Recording 7 1. Kelly Holmes must be really ecstatic about her success. Kelly Holmes must be absolutely ecstatic about her success. 2. An extremely big sports centre near here has just opened. A very big sports centre near here has just opened. 3. If you want to get to the top in athletics, it's really vital to get yourself a professional trainer. 4. Whenever he plays football, he comes back really filthy. Whenever he plays football, he comes back absolutely filthy. 5. She was absolutely exhausted at the end of the race. 6. I love running. I'd be really devastated if I had to give it up. Unit 8. Recording 8. 1. I want to be the last player onto the pitch. 2. I won the race easily. 3. I'm not going to train today. 4. You can do it by thinking about something different. 
Five. Why are you feeling so negative? Six. Will you help me tomorrow? Unit eight, recording nine. One. You need to cut down on how much salt you have in your food. Two. If none of us says anything to the police, we'll probably get away with it. Three. We're really looking forward to moving back to New Zealand. It'll be especially great to see all our friends. Four. I can't put up with his constant criticism any more. I've decided to move out. Five. The increase in salaries isn't keeping up with the rise in the cost of living. People's disposable income is getting less and less. Six. She's put in for a transfer to the London office to be nearer her parents. Seven. I think I've come up with a rather good solution to our problem. Eight. The delicious food more than made up for the slow service. Nine. All her students look up to her. She's an amazing teacher. Ten. I had to run to catch up with you. You walk incredibly fast. Unit eight, recording ten. Point four. And our next caller is Julie. So, what's on your mind, Julie? Well, guys, basically, Chris. Ah, now where have I heard that before? <laughs> I know, I know, but it feels like I've tried everything, and I'm just not getting anywhere. So, what exactly do you mean when you say you've tried everything? Well, I mean, there was this guy I fancied a couple of months ago at work. We used to have a bit of a laugh and a joke around the office, and had lunch together a few times. It all seemed to be going pretty well. I text him now and then, but then he seemed to just start avoiding me. What, like overnight? Well, I don't know about that, but it was pretty strange. And nothing had really changed. No, well. Like I said, I had been texting him quite a bit. What kind of things? <laughs> oh, nothing much.、Uh, silly things.、Uh, telling him I thought he was really cute, you know. Anything else? Well, I did send him the odd card and a big cake on his birthday to the office. To the office? Yeah. Well, maybe that was a bit over the top. He didn't think. So, Martina, apparently you're some kind of sports person, is that right? Yeah, well, I do a lot of long-distance running, you know, marathons and stuff. Oh yeah. So, what exactly were you phoning about? Well, just recently, I had this race, you know, a really big one, televised and everything. And well, how can I put it? I,、uh, you know, I just couldn't do it. Hmm. What do you mean, couldn't do it? Well, it was really hot, but about halfway. I was losing touch with the leaders, and I just had to stop, which is really unusual for me. And then I just couldn't get going again, and I just gave up. Wow, I see. And since then, I've lost all my confidence. I'm thinking I may have to give up running altogether. But really, it's been my life until now. Well, that sounds really difficult. Have you talked to anyone about how you're feeling? Yes. Well, I work with a sports psychologist, but she's just telling me to concentrate. So, what's your issue today, Tim? Uh, my job, I suppose. And what do you suppose about it? Well, I've been in my company for quite some time now, and it's just, well, I seem to have got a bit stuck. I think. Stuck? Yeah. Well, other people who started around the same time have got promoted and moved up, and I'm still doing exactly the same job as when I started. And you feel like you've been doing your current job okay? Um. Well, I suppose there have been one or two problems. I mean, I didn't really get on with one of my biggest clients, but that wasn't all my fault, as they were really annoying. But anyway, they didn't renew their contract with us, so I got into a bit of trouble about that. <laughs> And then I have been told off a few times about being late. So are you late for work often? Yeah, well, 
I guess so. Just how often, Tim? Well, maybe a couple of times a week. What? Every week? Pretty much, I suppose. It's just that I sleep really well. <laughs> and I never hear my alarm clock. I've tried different types, but it doesn't seem to make any difference. And the one I've got at the moment... Unit 9. Crime. Recording 1. 1. She plans to sue the hospital after they gave her the wrong operation. 2. Bailey was sentenced to three years in prison for his part in the robbery. 3. We lost the case this time, but there's going to be an appeal. We will never give up. Four. I'm afraid that the cost of the annual premium has gone up again. They say it's because of the number of claims last year. Five. My neighbour has been convicted of shoplifting, but luckily he doesn't have to go to prison. Six. Does this insurance plan cover things that are stolen from me while I'm on holiday? Seven. Can you guarantee that this TV will be delivered before Christmas? It's very important. Eight. They don't think the fire was an accident. They think it was arson. Nine. Ted's wife has filed for divorce. He's very upset about it. Ten. He's been arrested and charged with fraud. Apparently, he pretended that an expensive painting had been stolen to get the insurance money. Unit 9. Recording 2. Did I tell you about this really funny lawyer story that a friend of mine sent me on email the other day? No, go on. Well, the way it goes is that there's this lawyer in the USA, North Carolina or somewhere, and he buys this box of really rare and very, very expensive cigars. OK. And because they're so expensive, he decides to insure them. Against fire, amongst other things. Fair enough. Yes, except that within a month, having smoked his complete collection of these fantastic cigars, and without having made even his first payment for the insurance policy, the lawyer made a claim against the insurance company. What on earth for? Well, in his claim, the lawyer stated that the cigars were lost in a series of small fires. <laughs> How ridiculous! <laughs> yeah. And unsurprisingly, the insurance company refused to pay for the obvious reason that the man had smoked the cigars in the normal way. But then, the lawyer sued the insurance company and won! When he gave his decision, the judge agreed with the insurance company that the claim appeared ridiculous, but concluded that the lawyer had a policy from the company in which it guaranteed they could be insured against fire, without defining exactly what did or did not count as fire. And so the company would have to pay the claim. No, you're kidding. But that's not all. You see, rather than going through a long and expensive appeal, the insurance company accepted the decision and paid $15,000 to the lawyer for his loss of the valuable cigars in the fires. But now comes the best part. Go on, I can't wait. Then, after cashing the cheque, the lawyer was arrested. The insurance company had him charged with 24 counts of arson. With his own insurance claim and evidence from the previous case being used against him, the lawyer was convicted of deliberately burning his insured property. And so, can you believe it, he was sentenced to 24 months in jail and a $24,000 fine. No! Is that really true? Cross my heart! My friend said he got it from a real newspaper. How amazing! Unit 9, Recording 3 Did you see these photos in the paper? It says they're of someone who was in the middle of stealing computer equipment from someone's house. Really? So, how did they manage to do that? I'm not sure. 
I suppose they must have fixed up some kind of security camera. What? Inside their own house? Yeah, that would be pretty unusual. Do you think the thief realised he was being caught on camera? He can't have done, can he? Otherwise he'd have taken the camera too. <laughs> <laughs> Unit 9, Recording 4 1. We don't know who took the money. There were lots of people in the office during the day and it might have been any of them. 2. I wonder why Pete didn't turn up to do his community service. He can't have forgotten about it. I reminded him yesterday. 3. I'm not sure where Jo is. She might have gone round to Sally's. They're working on a school project together. 4. How did you know about the surprise party? Someone must have told you. 5. You can't have spent all your birthday money already. You got nearly a hundred pounds. 6. I can't have left my keys at home. I remember feeling them in my jacket pocket when I got on the bus. 7. She can't have finished her homework yet. She only started it at nine o'clock. Eight. I've lost one of my gloves. I might have dropped it on the way to work. Unit nine, recording five. And finally today, a house burglar was given an 11-month prison sentence today after admitting breaking into a local house and stealing thousands of pounds worth of computer equipment. The householder, Duncan Grisby, who had been burgled on a previous occasion, set up a webcam which would start recording as soon as it detected movement in the room. But the particularly clever thing was that even though the burglar stole the computer and webcam, the images had already been sent via the internet to a private email address. The police officer in charge of the case commented after the trial. After the break-in was discovered, Mr Grisby simply gave us the email address and we were able to watch several minutes of footage and identify the thief who is quite well known to us. When he initially denied breaking into the property, we were simply able to show him the footage. The webcam made our job really easy. It was a pleasure to show him the pictures and see his expression when we interviewed him. Unit 9, Recording 6 Mr Sherlock Holmes, I must ask you first, how is it that you have the same name as Sherlock Holmes, the great detective from London? Oh, please call me Holmes. That's what my friends and family call me. Well, you see, my parents were great fans of the original Conan Doyle stories. Both parents, my father especially, would spend hours reading the adventures to me, even as a child. Really? Yes. And when I was born, they discussed a number of first names. They wanted to give their son a name that was uncommon, but also that represented something special. They didn't take long to decide on Sherlock Holmes, as he was their favorite literary figure, and they knew no one would forget me once they'd heard my name. <laughs> and boy, were they right! <laughs> <laughs> so, how do people in general react when you introduce yourself to them? Well, I get all kinds of reactions, really. Everything from the usual... Where's Dr. Watson type comments to people just thinking I'm being funny. I can imagine. And do you mind? No, not at all. I never have done. I think the best reaction was when I was in San Francisco one time. I went into an electronics store to buy a TV. The clerk behind the counter was a young lady about uh, 18 or so. When she saw the name on my credit card, she stared at it for about 10 full seconds. She slowly lifted her face to look at me and she said, in all sincerity, I didn't know you were real. Wait till I tell my friends I saw the real Sherlock Holmes. No. Yes! You could have knocked her over with a feather. The expression on her face was as if she'd seen a ghost. It was very amusing. <laughs> Given your name, do you feel that you have any special talent or ability to solve mysteries in everyday life? 
Well, I will say that having such a name does mean that people often turn to me if anything unusual happens. For example, if I'm watching TV with a friend or family member and a magician comes on and does some kind of trick, all eyes turn to me to explain how it's done. Really? How funny. Ah, it's not as if I've even ever been interested in magic. Anyway, about two years ago, an old family friend suddenly disappeared from work with about $7,000. His mother hadn't heard from him for days. Even though we hadn't been in touch for years, she called me after the local police said they couldn't help. To keep her calm, I met her at her son's house, pulled out my torch and magnifying glass, and slowly went through the house looking for clues. And did you actually find any? Well, fortunately, he had left some of his email messages undeleted in his computer system. Ah. It seemed to suggest that he had deliberately taken the money to leave town and live in a warmer climate, which was what I told his mother. In the end, it turned out that he realized he couldn't really start a new life on only $7,000, and he returned to face the justice system. It was hard for him, but I was pleased to have worked out what happened. Just like your namesake. <laughs> yes. That's actually impressive. Unit 9, Recording 7 Nick Leeson's life started as a classic rags-to-riches story. He was born into a working-class family and left school with almost no qualifications. Nonetheless, in the early 1980s, he got a series of clerical jobs with different banks ending up with Bearings, a well-known investment bank, where he did well and received rapid promotion. Before long, he was making millions for Bearings by betting on the future direction of the Japanese stock exchange. His bosses back in London were delighted with his large profits and put more and more trust in him. By the end of 1993, he had made more than £10 million, about 10% of the total profit of the bank for that year. However, what the bank didn't know was that Leeson had a special account where he was hiding his losses. By December 94, the losses hidden in that account totaled $512 million. As the losses grew, Leeson requested extra funds to continue trading, hoping to get himself out of the mess by more deals. In the end, Leeson managed to lose the bank $1.3 billion dollars and effectively destroyed bearings. As the direct result of his actions, he had wiped out the 233-year-old Bearings Investment Bank, who proudly counted the Queen as a client. Investors saw their savings wiped out, and some 1,200 of Leeson's fellow employees lost their jobs. What became of Leeson? After going on the run, the world's most wanted man, on the cover of every newspaper checked in on a flight to Europe using his own name and hiding beneath a baseball cap. The German authorities were alerted and the police were there to arrest Leeson as he touched down. In December 1995, a court in Singapore sentenced him to six and a half years. In jail, he is said to have spent a lot of time doing exercise and he also, apparently, found God. He was released early in the summer of 1999 and, after his return to the UK, found that he was effectively homeless and without a job. Leeson, though, has managed to bounce back and make the most of his experiences. He has made an estimated £50,000 from his book and the fee for selling his story to the newspapers is reported to be about three times that amount. The story has also been turned into a film called Rogue Trader, Starring you and McGregor. Unit 10. Mind. Recording 1. 1. Once I had a premonition that something awful was going to happen to an old school friend of mine, Carola, who'd moved to Australia and I hadn't seen for ages. I somehow knew something was going to happen and then later that day another friend of mine phoned to say that Carola had had an accident and was in hospital. 
A few other things like that have happened recently, so nowadays I take my premonitions a bit more seriously than I used to. 2. It was really weird the other day, because I was at my brother's 30th birthday party and was talking to some people there, and then, in the middle of the conversation, I suddenly had a really strong feeling of déjà vu. I just felt that the whole thing, you know, the place, the people, the exact conversation, had all happened before in exactly the same way. It made me feel quite strange for a couple of minutes. 3. More and more in my life, I think I've learnt to trust my intuition. It could be anything, really, like deciding which job to apply for, or knowing which road to take if I get lost, or having a feeling that someone's lying to me. I find if I start analysing things and trying to work it out, I get confused. But if I go with my gut feeling, without thinking about things too much, it's funny, but I find I'm usually right. 4. My cousins are twins, and they have always been incredibly close. Now they are older, they still have an amazing sixth sense about each other. They always seem to know when something happens to the other one, even if they're miles apart. One of them knows if something important has happened to the other one, especially if they're in trouble or hurt in some way. 5. I've only been unconscious once in my life, and that was when I was playing football with some friends. We used to play every Sunday, and I really enjoyed it, but I often got injured. One day, I was knocked unconscious by someone. I still don't really know how it happened. I just remember waking up, lying on the grass, looking up at a group of about 20 people all staring down at me. I hadn't got a clue what was going on. 6. I think that I'm a very single-minded person. I mean, I really drive myself hard to succeed at everything I do. The other day, I was wondering why I let myself work so hard and get so stressed about things. And I think it's maybe because I have a subconscious fear of failure. I think that deep down, without really being aware of it, most of the time, I'm really scared of not succeeding in everything I do. Maybe it's to do with my parents. They always expected me to be the best at school. Unit 10, Recording 2 1. How do you feel about Paul McKenna? Well, I reckon he's probably genuine myself. It sounds as if his clients go away satisfied. So even if we don't really understand how he does it, if you ask me, it doesn't really matter. He must be doing something right. Some people want to know how everything works, but I'm in favour of just accepting it if it works for you, not analysing things too much. 2. And what are your views on hypnosis? Do you have any strong feelings about it? Yes, I do. I've always believed that people like Paul McKenna are just good showmen. To my mind, it's all rubbish. He's just good at being nice to people, so they're a bit happier at the time. But I have my doubts about how much he can actually do for people in the long term. I'm sceptical that hypnosis has any effect at all, and I'm against people paying for a service and getting nothing real in return. I mean, I doubt hypnosis actually works for anyone. 3. What do you think of hypnosis? From my point of view, I have to say that when I went for a session to a hypnotist, it was fantastic. It saved me my job. I mean... I was able to deal with the stress of my job much better after that, and I'm convinced that it was the hypnosis that helped me. In fact, if I hadn't gone to the session, I suspect I would have left my job by now. Unit 10, Recording 3 Welcome to Modern World. On the programme today... We're talking to Joe Carlson about the power of persuasion. All around us, there are images on television, jingles on the radio, adverts in magazines, sound bites on the news, offers in the shops. They're all hard at work, trying to make us believe something or persuading us to buy something. Fear not, however. Joe Carlson is here to reveal their secrets and show us how to resist all this persuasion. Hello, Joe. Hello. 
First, persuading people is big business, isn't it? I mean, supermarkets and politicians, advertisers and salespeople, they all take it very seriously, don't they? Yes. They spend a lot of money on working out the best psychological tricks to guarantee that even the most cautious among us are open to manipulation. Let's take supermarkets, then. How do they make us buy things we don't necessarily want? What are some of their tricks? Well, firstly, they try to relax us by playing music and by pumping the smell of freshly baked bread into the store. Studies have shown that the smell makes people buy more. <laughs> no, I've done that without even thinking about it. Exactly. Most of the time, we're completely unaware of what's happening. It's subconscious persuasion. And what about reward cards? Ah, yes. Well, from the supermarket's point of view, reward cards are a huge success story. As customers, we think we're being rewarded for shopping at that particular supermarket. What's really happening, however, is that the store is basically not only tempting us to shop there again, but also getting vital information about what we're buying. More information to help them work out how to persuade us to buy even more things. That's right. So, what about the advertising industry? What secrets can you reveal about that? In what ways does it persuade us to buy particular products? Well, there's so much. And no matter how much we think we know about what the advertisers are doing, they still tend to win. <laughs> we still fall for the advert and end up buying the product. Yes. Basically, there are two types of ads. Those that appeal to the thinking part of our brain and those that appeal to the emotional part. So for what type of products would they advertise by appealing to the thinking part of our brain? Well, they're mostly used for things which have little emotional appeal, for example, cleaning products. They give us information about the product and try to influence us that way. However, adverts which go for our emotions are usually much more successful. In using emotion, adverts exploit psychoanalytical theories about the subconscious. I mean, they know that images can reach our emotions at a level that we're not aware of and so are much more powerful in persuading us to do things. So what kinds of emotions are used? Well, adverts for different brands of clothes often want to make us feel that we belong. For example, by showing us how to buy the right clothes to fit in with our friends. And adverts for insurance play on our need to feel safe. For example, they might show a family happily spending their insurance money buying new things when their house has been burgled. Self-esteem is an important one too. Many ads for luxury products like expensive cars work on making us feel good about ourselves and the lifestyles that we could have. Celebrities are used a lot too, aren't they? Yes, that's very popular. Celebrities are often used as a quick way of getting the message across. Their success and familiarity makes them feel safe, interesting, cool, whatever. We see our favourite pop star drinking a particular fizzy drink and we're immediately persuaded to buy it. Unit 10, recording 4. 1. Advertising. 2. Advertisement. 3. Advert. Unit 10, recording 5. 1. They persuade us to buy things we may not want. 2. We carry on using reward cards at the same supermarket. 3. Adverts for clothes often want to make us feel that we belong. 4. I try to resist buying expensive designer clothes, but it's difficult. 5. You could try leaving your credit card at home if you don't want to spend so much. Unit 10, recording 6. 1. I told a colleague that I'd been using one of those self-help CDs to help deal with my stress. Then... In the middle of a meeting with some other colleagues, he suddenly blurted out everything I'd told him. Honestly, I was lost for words. I was so shocked, I didn't know what to say. 2. I went to the cinema last weekend, and the people behind me were whispering to each other throughout the whole film. They didn't seem to notice that they were annoying everyone else. In the end, 
my friend had a word with them and they stopped, but by that time the film was nearly over. 3. My cousin has been staying with me for the last week. I must say, she's quite irritating. She's really loud, and every time I say anything, she shrieks with laughter. The other thing she does is constantly interrupt people when they're in the middle of a conversation. I don't mean to be horrible, but I'll be really glad when she goes. 4. I did my first presentation at work yesterday and it was OK, but at the end one of my colleagues told me that I'd been mumbling and he couldn't really hear me. He's the kind of person who isn't afraid to speak his mind and I was a bit upset at first. I suppose it's useful feedback, though. Unit 10, Recording 7 I can't believe that spelling is so difficult in English. In Spanish, it's so easy. There are so many exceptions in English that every time I think I've learned a rule, I find a word that breaks it. But I do think there are some quite nice words in English. I mean, they are hard to spell, but I like the fact that some of them are so strange. Like the G-H-T words, for example. Brought, caught, fight. You know, why do they have G-H-T? I think the best way to remember how to spell words is just to repeat them. I write them down lots of times, and I also chant the spelling to myself. You know, like, for example, brought. I say B-R-O-U-G-H-T. B-R-O-U-G-H-T. B -R -O -U -G -H -T. O U G H T. It's a bit like brainwashing or mind control. In the end, it works. Copyright Pearson Education Limited 2006.